Uh, good afternoon, Daryl. I would like to say that it's a pleasure for me to come here. I think that this is the third time that I come to this university. And I would, I would like also to thank Dr. Martin for the invitation of this talk. And as you may know, I'm a PhD student in Brazil in the University Federal Rural of Rio de Janeiro. And I came to Czech Republic for one year uh, of stay in the Thomas Scholz lab in Czech Republic. We have a long term of uh, partnership and he was in Brazil uh, more than three times. Uh, and uh, each year that he was there, he was like three months working with us in the sample, in the sample trips and so on. So for me, it, it was a pleasure to come here for one year and work on my PhD thesis. So uh, the purpose of my talk is to share with you part of my results uh, of my PhD on the diversity of protocephalidians tapeworms in freshwater fish uh, in South America. So, uh, my university is localized in Seropédica, that is close to Rio de Janeiro city, but unfortunately, we don't have Copacabana Beach as an uh, image from our window, so we, we can't go there so often. It's like four hours from Seropédica. But, on the other hand, we have one of the most beautiful uh, universities in Brazil, and one of the oldest ones. Not so old as like here, it's like uh, uh, 1905 that was founded, but uh, it's also the biggest campus of Latin America, and uh, it, it has more than 40 undergraduate and graduate programs in this university, and I'm working in the laboratory of fish parasitology under guidance of um, José Luis Luque, and we are focused there in the taxonomy and the ecology of parasites from freshwater and marine fish. So what are tapeworms, or what, what is Cestoda? Cestoda is a class of uh, platyomids that comprise more than 5,000 species. They can be found in all kinds of environments. They are obligate endoparasites of the digestive system. Why? They don't have it. So they must be in the intestine of the host to absorb the nutrients directly from this uh, site. They have as organ of attachment the scolex, this structure in the anterior part of the body. And the body is formed by repetition of proglottides and uh, in total is called as strobula. The bore surface has an interesting uh, feature that is the mycotrix that are responsible for the absorption of the nutrients. And, and, they are, and they can be used even for taxonomic identification. So it's really important structure for uh, these worms. They have an heteroxenous life cycle, which means that they need intermediate hosts to complete their, their cycles and they are exclusively transmitted via food chain. Some orders, like Cyclophilia and Diphilobotridia, are of medical and veterinary importance. And they can cause important diseases like tenesis and hidatidosis. So, the presentation was divided in three main parts, and the first one, I'd like to show you an overview about Protocephalidia, going through some specific points, and also to introduce you the general diversity. <coughs> Two of the points, you may find additional information in our recent publication that I will give you, I don't know, maybe from here. Yeah, it's better, no, maybe here. You, I don't know if you are, just pass for the people, sorry. So in this checklist, we compiled all uh, records of uh, fish cestodes in South America. 
and there is a lot of information about the host parasite associations and the geographical distribution. And the second part of the presentation, uh, I will show you some pictures of two expeditions that we have performed in the Xingu River, in the Brazilian Amazon. And I will show you that the difference of experience or the approach that we have used can be determined, can be uh, really uh, interfere in the final results of a formal description. And yeah, in the last part, I will show you how to formally describe a new tax, a new taxon of uh, Protocephalidia. That I will show you the example of this guy, that is a new uh, genus and species that we described from uh, fish in the Xingu River as well. So, Protocephalidians are characterized by having unscolex building four suckers that can be uniloculated, like those, biloculated, or even triloculated. Just one genus has this character. And just for you have an idea how diverse is, are the scolex of these worms in South America, here we have uh, some examples of uh, those scolex that they can, they can really vary in form and can be really beautiful. Look at that. It's really nice. Uh, there are, sorry, there are 19 recognized orders within Cestoda. And Protocephalida has been considered a monophyletic group for a long time. They are parasites prim primarily of fish, freshwater fish, but they can be also find, found in reptiles, amphibians, and one species found in a mammal. But recently, it um, was erected a new order called Oncoprotocephalidia that grouping together the Protocephalidia and some hook bearing members of the paraphyletic Tetraphilidia. Tetraphilidia is like a catch all group. Everything that nobody, no, nobody has a clue what is that they put in tetraphilite. And those guys, they did an analysis of 28S uh, ribosomal gene, and they formed a monoflat group with uh, protocephalidia. So they erected this new order. But they are really uh, not, not similar morphologically, as you can see here, and ecologically as well. They have as a host sharks and rays. So, Still, we are looking for synapomorphies that could, synapomorphies, I mean, uh, morphological characters that we could link uh, both of the, the groups. There is just one family in this order, and this family is subdivided in 14 uh, subfamilies. And the subfamilies are characterized by the position of the internal organs related to the inner longitudinal musculature. So if they are medullary uh, distributed or if they are cortical, they are in different subfamilies. And in South America, we have nine of uh, those subfamilies representatives, some species, and uh, six are endemic in there. You can find just in South America. However, this subfamilial classification uh, seems to be artificial. <clears throat> Why? Based on also the ribosomal data, you can see here, uh, for example, this everything that is in blue, it belongs to just a one subfamily. So you can see that the isolates cluster in different parts of the tree, which means that they don't form a monophyletic group. The non-neotropical taxa, they are all earlier uh, diverging uh, and they are more stable phylogenetically. But when you have a look in the most of the neotropical uh, clades, they cluster in a large polytomy that we don't have any clue about the evolutionary um, history of those specimens. And it's argued that several uh, colonization events in 
South America and also in, in their hosts may be a cause of, or for this lack of signal. And during my PhD thesis, I have sequenced more than 100 um, isolates from neotropical plate and all of them cluster in this large polytomy, which means that they don't increase the phylogenetic resolution, at least using the 28S data. So this gene seems unsuitable uh, for unravel the, the evolutionary history of this group, <coughs> but they can be used for specific terminal plates, such as some uh, genera and some species. They can be used for um, uh, the study of phylogenetic history. And just to have an idea how diverse is, this, is the Sparta in South America, there are 37 uh, genera described from freshwater fish in, in this continent that exceeds by far the other regions of the world. Concerning now uh, more specifically about my thesis about the uh, from freshwater fish in South America, there are described 102 species and that represents more than 30% of all diversity in the world. And mostly they are parasites of siluriform catfishes. And the family Pimelodidae is uh, also has the most number of species described. They are well known about the high host specificity. What it means? It <coughs> means that usually we have one single species of uh, parasite infecting one species of host. And considering that only 4% of the poten potential uh, fish hosts have been examined in South America, we are really far from well-known uh, this group, the diverse of this group in South America. The two biggest, um, largest uh, river bases in South America, they show the major number of described species. We can find also two additional species in Colombia, in the Magdalena River Basin. <coughs> There are other um, river basins that, that there are reports, but the descriptions just in two, in these three uh, river basins that there is uh, in the literature. And during my PhD, I performed six new uh, sampling trips to three in the Amazon river basin, one in the Tocantins, Araguaia, that represents the first study in this uh, basin, and two in the Paraná. As part of the outcomes of these uh, studies, of this sampling, we have two new genera and three new species that we already published, and seven putative new species that we are still uh, looking to describe. <coughs> also, from Tocantins, Araguaia, we have new geographical records, and from Paraná, we have three putative uh, new species. So, beginning the, of the second part of the presentation. Uh, we performed two, as I told you, uh, two sample trips to the Xingu River in 2013-2014, and in the first one, I was not well prepared, I didn't know how to collect, how to fix, and how to process the parasites. And the second one, I had more experience because I was with Thomas in some of sample trips, and uh, I could do it properly. So my aim in this uh, uh, part of the presentation is to show you how it matter, matters. Uh, how you collect the, the, the parasites matters a lot when you want to describe a uh, species. Of Sestoda. So, Shingo River is localized uh, as a tributary of the Amazon River, and we collected near the city of Altamira. I don't know if you, 
you don't know about that. Uh, in Altamira, they are building now the biggest uh, dam, hydroelectric dam uh, in the world. And this uh, affected a lot the population. So, if you see this part of the, the margin of the river, everything could be floated. And the population are really scared about that. And uh, they are really deforesting a lot. And... Uh, I want just to, to show you how the humans can really affect the environment, and I, I really I don't like this. So, uh, it's really important when you are in the field that you have every uh, equipment by hand. Because normally the fishermen will bring you like six, seven fish, and you must to be really fast, you must be precise. Why? Cestodes, they are <clears throat> really fragile. They decompose really fast. And you can imagine in Amazon, the high hum humidity, uh, it's really a problem when you want to describe some, some taxon. So here you can see how I was uh, preparing the first one. I didn't have even uh, some big petri dishes. And the second one, everything was organized. I had my molecular grade ethanol, my dissection uh, case, and so on. Yeah, really bad. This is for lunch. This is for lunch, yes. <laughs> so, also the labeling. It may seem obvious that you must label our samples properly, but I, I still think that this is really uh, important part of the, the sampling because it must be logical. Uh, so, like in this uh, example, I have BAX02, uh, which means Parai State, Shingu River, and host number two. And also, the parasites are label, labeling with the same uh, code, but we just add A, B, C, D, and so on for uh, each of the specimens. And also, it's important to keep a piece of the flesh of the host for molecular identification. Some genera are really uh, problematic concerning the identification of their species, species. And frankly speaking, we are not ichthyologists. So sometimes I, I have a lot of troubles with that. So it, it is important to collect and to work in synergy with, with uh, ichthyologists that may help you to the identification of uh, this host. And again, only fresh hosts matters because otherwise you get decomposed tapeworms that are not suitable for description. Even for sequencing, sometimes I, I had uh, trouble to sequence that parasites. Uh, for me, this is the most important part of uh, the, the sampling, the fixation. Uh, in a best scenario, we must have uh, the parasites alive, and then we must clean the, the cestodes, clean the scolex, clean the strobla, because this will really uh, interfere in our final uh, result. And also using this saline solution that, that, that can keep uh, the, the animal alive uh, is similar to the intestine of the, the host, similar concentration of uh, salt. And then we fix, fix the tapeworm in a hot fixative. This is really important. And by experience, the formaline, formaline 4% is the, the best one. From that, we will get uh, straight worms that are uh, suitable for scanning, scanning electron microscope and for staining. Otherwise, if you get a dead worm uh, and fix in a cold fixative, like formalin 4%, you can get a coiled worm that is uh, <coughs> unsuitable for scanning and for staining. Here is just a practical example how it can interfere, if you don't believe me. Uh, this specimen was badly fixed. 
we can't work on, on this spectrum, you can't see the internal organs. Uh, they are dark or a little bit brown. And also in the scanning uh, electron images, we can see some artifact. It's a little bit wrinkled here. They are the same species. And here you can see some wrinkles, some deformation. That's not uh, ideal for a, for a description. Also, it's really important to keep the molecular vultures. Uh, the best is the, to keep the hologenophore. That is the same specimen that you used for sequencing. Uh, you put the posterior part in the molecular grade alcohol and the anterior part you fix in for hot formalin, formalin and then you can work, uh, you can use for the morphological studies. Other term that we can, uh, or other vulture that we can use is the parachinophore. That means it's the same, uh, the individual from the same population of that one that you use for the sequencing. But this is not uh, so good for us because some species of uh, fish, they can uh, harbor more than seven or eight species of proteo. So you may uh, work in different taxa and thinking that they are the same. So it's best to keep the hologenophore. Uh, this is the third part of the, and the last one of my presentation. Uh, I'll show you the description of Fresella vulture, this new genus that uh, I, I've told you. And here we have the summarized steps of the description. Those specimens that we have used for uh, in a hot fixative, in a hot formalin, we can use to get the morphological data. So we use part of them for staining and then mounting the entire specimen that can be used for the morphological description and to get the morphometrical data. And also part we use for uh, histology that it's important to get the cross-section to see in which subfamily they are placed. And finally, the scanning uh, electron microscope, it's really important to, to know the shape of this collex and also the type of microtrix, that structure that I told you that is responsible for the absorption of nutrients. Then, part of the posterior piece of the worm that you fix it in, in alcohol, you can uh, use standard protocols for uh, the to get the molecular data and then assess the phylogenetic relationships of this taxon with the other protocephalids. So, this is the, the host for this uh, new genre, Tocantinsia pirezi. This is an Aconopteride catfish that we collected in Xingu River. And um, we dissect nine specimens, and just one was really heavily infected, as you can see. And each of those parasites, they can reach up to 11 centimeters. So they are really big tapeworms. And all of them we found just in the anterior intestine. These collects were mostly fixed, really um, heavily attached. attached to the intestine of the host. But before to start the description, we have some points that we, we need to consider. So I will uh, show you these points in the next slides. So in which subfamily we placed these uh, specimens? We placed in protocephaline because all of the internal organs they are placed um, medullary. So all are internal to the longitudinal musculature. You can see here the tests, the vitellin follicles, the ovary, and the uterus. All of them are um, medullary. So the next step is to compare with the other known genera inside this subfamily. 
So we compared with the 16 genera and our specimens couldn't be allocated in any of them. Therefore, we needed to propose a new uh, genus and a new species. As uh, diagnostic features for this new genus, we have oops, sorry. We have the scolex, the conical form, and bearing one uh, apical organ here. That is unusual for this kind of tapeworm. And the, the metascolex is divided in two zones. The anterior, anterior one that is heavily wrinkled and the posterior one that is sparsely wrinkled and with deep uh, longitudinal wrinkles. Uh, also important feature of this tapeworm that is that the ovary, this is the lobe of the ovary, can penetrate in the dorsal cortex. So they are placed in, in protocephaly, but they have some lobes, lobes of the ovary placed in, penetrating the dorsal cortex. And also the conspicuous concentration of uh, muscles in the lateral side of the body. Concerning the phylogenetic relationships of these uh, specimens with other protocephalids, we have our Fresella here that cluster together in a clade with parasites from snakes and from the only mammal that uh, is host for, for protocephalidians. But, as you can see, we don't have any support for this relationship, so we don't know the exactly uh, relationship with this guy and the other uh, groups in, in this clade. And it agrees with the idea that several event, events of colonization uh, of both zoogeographical regions and hosts have happened. Why? Here we have in this clade unrelated hosts, snakes, mammal, and one fish, and from different uh, zoogeographical regions from uh, Asia, from South America, uh, from uh, North America, and so on. But surprisingly, I told you at the beginning that this subfamily classification um, is uh, is artificial. Here, all of them, all of these five genera, belongs to the subfamily Protocephaline. So. The presentation is basically over, but I want to show you uh, some pictures of the sample trips that we have done uh, during three years or four years of uh, sampling. So, this is the Araguaia River. Uh, this is the place that it was never studied for cestodes, and this is the third largest river basin in Brazil after Paraná and the Amazon, and they are known by the beaks of bright sandy. Also, they are home for this friendly guy, uh, this uh, dolphin, Araguayan uh, river dolphin, uh, that it's really nice, but the fishermen, they really are afraid of uh, this, uh, this species, because when they put the nets, uh, to catch the, the fish, they don't respect, they just go through the nets and eat all fish that, <laughs> that the fishermen are uh, willing to, to catch. So they are not so friends for the, the fishermen. And here was our lab. Uh, we were afraid at the beginning because it was windy, really windy, and we were afraid that it would be falling down on us. But finally, we could work, we, we collected, we fixed it, and we could manage to handle uh, this, this collection. And I would like to show you this uh, host. It's really interesting, I really like this host, because it's the only alive uh, member of the, gen the genus Fractocephalus. The other species of the genus are known just from fossil. <coughs> and the estimation 
is that the minimum age is about 30.5 million of years, so it's really old uh, host. And they can reach more than 80 kilos. I don't know how many kilos this one had, but maybe 30 kilos or something like that. And they, they are, um, the specimens of uh, this host is, is um, host for seven or eight species of proteo. So for us, it's really um, interesting to work on. The other uh, uh, place that we have been collecting is close to the mouth of the Amazon River in the Macapá city in the north of Brazil. Uh, this is really amazing. Uh, for me, it was impressive because this is the river and you can't see the margin, the, 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 uh, the other margin. So it's like an ocean already. <clears throat> and for me, it was really impressive. And in this city also, it's interesting that the Ecuador line runs through the middle of uh, the city. See, here was <laughs> our uh, lab again, but it was in the fisherman house. He was really kind and uh, gave, uh, gave us some uh, bread and some coffee. And we could handle, it was easy, following that procedure that I told you, we can sample everywhere. Because normally the cestodes are big, so we don't need microscope or yeah, sterile microscope to, to see them. And when you have a live fish, you have a live uh, parasites that are easily to distinguish in the middle of the, the intestine content. And here is that uh, Ecuador line that for me was a little bit strange to be in the North Hemisphere and the South Hemisphere in the same time. So it was uh, interesting. And the last one is uh, the uh, Pantanal wetlands that for me it's the most beautiful place that I have ever been. This is the largest tropical wetland area in the world and also uh, UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's really amazing the amount of birds, mammals and fish that we can find in, in, in this area. I, I took photos of this uh, guy because First of all, it's a beautiful bird, and uh, and then this this bird was threatened for extinction like 30 years ago, and uh, after some studies for conservation, now they are stable, they are okay, and they once they had a couple, they are made for a life. So they just split when they die. So it's really romantic and nice this bird. And also, for me, it was amazing how many caimans uh, we, <clears throat> we can see in Pantanal. They are like uh, pets, they are like dogs or, or cats. They are everywhere. It's the biggest population uh, in the world. More than 10 million of individuals you can find in, in Pantanal, in Brazil. And Thomas even want to take one, this is my supervisor, I don't know if you, yeah, you may know, don't know. He wanted one as a petty, but the guy, the, the Kaiman was not so kind of him, so he released it, and uh, it was like that. So, uh, I would like to thank my supervisor in Brazil, José Luis Luque, for the guidance during my PhD thesis. Uh, also, to Thomas and Alain to, for introducing me this uh, interesting and fascinating group of tapeworms and also Honza that was patient to teach me uh, the basic molecular biology that I have learned. Also, I want to uh, thank my laboratory in Brazil and the lab in Czesky Bdejovici that I spent one year with them and they were really helpful uh, for me. And also the grants that made it possible for me uh, to perform my uh, samples and to finish my PhD thesis. Thanks for your attention.
very educative presentation, <laughs> I guess. So, and now the presentation is open for questions. Would you like to ask something? Oh, I have no question, just a comment. I was very impressed by your work. It's nice, very great, but congratulations. I, I don't agree with his last slide. <laughs> awesome. You know why? Yeah, but I have. Cestodes are more beautiful than monochainous. Not <laughs> a little bit ugly. It's very lovely. Everyone has a new <laughs> And you see the fish? Just run away from, from the parasites. <laughs> Be, be so, careful here. Here is a monochain of plain sign. It's a sensitive topic. Let's start to walk on a thin ice. <laughs> and we would like to have some more questions. We have plenty of time to ask. Uh, I would like to ask if there is an explanation why the group of uh, proteocephalids is much more diverse in South America than the other part of the world? Yeah, interesting question. Uh, it's... They, they say that the origin of proteocephalidians was in the Africa, and uh, during the Guanduana uh, splitting, uh, these tapeworms really irradiated in freshwater fish in South America. And we have explosive radiation of hosts. The catfish, they really were, um, they have a recent uh, radiation in South America and the parasites irradiated with them. So I think that this is the explanation of uh, a kind. It's not a ho uh, host parasite coevolution, but uh, they have several events of colonization. And uh, I think that this is the, yeah, the answer. May I ask you what uh, events of colonization do you mean? Huh? Did you said that there were some several events of colonization of some of our American hosts. What do you mean? I mean that was like a host switching. They they are just jumping host by host without any uh, kind of evolution or, or pattern. So if you see the, the tree, I can... Where is it? Yeah, here. So in the same plate we can see, uh, here is a big polytomy, but <clears throat> parasites from snakes, from fish, <clears throat> from uh, even one species of turtle. So for me it was like a jumping, uh, host by host, and uh, this was like several events of colonization that I mean. Now we will have one very serious question. <clears throat> you said that this is the reason for big diversity of systems of your interests are radiation of fish. Mm -hmm. Is there any hypothesis what was the reason of radiation of fish in South America? Oh, you know, it's very easy to explain that the radiation of fish mm -hmm. is the reason for radiation of predator. What was the reason for that one? For the, for the, is, is it described? The ethologists don't interested in that? I don't have. Would you say questions for it? Ah, no, I, I, I don't. <coughs> ah, I mean to repeat. Yeah. Yeah. He, he asked the, uh, what's the reason for this uh, radiation, but I don't have the answer. Uh, I, th I think that there are studies about that for sure, but uh, now yeah, I'm not sure to, to answer you this, this question. Yes. I think you have speak about uh, great specificity. I think you have speak about yes, high host specificity. Have you. And yes, just to, this is in your work, it was, or it was in the bibliography that most in, of in, uh, no, in the bibliography, but I also uh, found like the same pattern okay. of host specificity. Okay, this is very just. Uh, I don't know because you have worked on specifically. I think in your systematic in your thesis. 
but this is very good because if so be, so many species in your, in this family and uh, the big uh, specificity i i don't know if you know that it can be used like tags and model for uh, evaluation of uh, other parameter of environment yes for sure they, they they can be used as a I, model i want to ask you if it was there is some paper <coughs> cross the this uh, specificity of, uh, around the protocephalus and uh, also the tags if, if is there some paper saying yes. about this host specificity? Well, you, because it is very big specificity, yes. the host are very, yeah. uh, so many host and the specificity is very important mm -hmm. and uh, it was some work. Uh, there is one uh, big paper of uh, Alain de Chambrier, one of the my co-authors, uh, in Paraguay, he collected like, uh, I don't know how many fish, but he found uh, 50 species of uh, parasites infecting mostly of them infect just one uh, single host oh. so it was like the species. most important uh, paper that i guess that showed us yeah. this high specificity yeah because uh, just uh, to know because we have work on this little bit and we are working when there is high specificity it gives very very good knowledge about the, the environment where you are working yes it yes give you more sure. data to make your work more Important. Yes, I. Just, uh, yeah, I'm more focused on the taxonomical yes. part, but I. It, it's true yeah. that uh, you can get information from that. Yes. Thank you. And what is the <coughs> intermediate host for, for these systems? Are they are um, arthropods, uh, copepods? Mm -hmm. So there is any no study in South America about the life cycles, but there are some studies in Europe and in North America. So they use. <clears throat> one or two uh, invertebrates, uh, copepts as a host. I have a question related to the previous one. Uh, you said that 35% of species, they are generalists, uh, or they, they, they can infect more uh, host species. No, no, actually, third, uh, which, sorry? So you, you show that 65% are uh, host specific. Yes. I understood it. Yes, yeah. yeah. Sixty-five percent are uh, it is high specificity. It's Oyoxenus whole specificity, which means that they have just one single. Uh, yeah. Host. yeah. So, so for the remaining thirty-five percent, so the, they, they can have more uh, hosts. Yes, but normally it's just in the same genera of host. Yeah. yeah. Like, but, but even in this this case, do you think that they are really generalists, or there are some? intraspecific lineages which are uh, not distinguishable morphologically and they can, these genetic lineages within parasite species, they can infect different hosts. It, yeah, good Is question. It, it depends of the, the approach that you are using. For example, I'm working mostly in the 28 as a uh, uh, marker and uh, it do doesn't show uh, so many uh, difference for this uh, species for these populations or so on. So I've never found a uh, difference genetically. They were pretty the same um, in different fish holes. But as I told you, mostly in the same uh, genera or genus, genus of a host. Yeah, but 28S is not very... Yes, it's not, yes. So I tried, I tried living uh, Cox one, and, uh, but I had just few sequences. And uh, just to, to know, to see if this uh, signal that we don't have with turn s appears in this uh, um, gene. And it was like the same result. It was a large polytomy. I couldn't uh, have any, any clue about the, the relationships. Okay, thanks. This high host specificity. So we can pretty much guess how many species are here on this scribe, so. How, how much work do you have? Yes, no, for so sure. How, this how, is how much work do you have? This was what I mean to show that we don't know. We, this checklist, it's a big one, but it's still, it's like a, just a lot to Just the beginning, yes. Okay. I don't like this, but 
Uh, I have a question about the, the anatomy of the new species mm -hmm. because you said that uh, concerning the ovary, you observed that uh, in some uh, individuals the ovary could. Uh, you said something about the ovary. Here, I can yeah. show you. You said that it can be uh, close to that. I, I don't see exactly what is it. Here? you can see that the part of the ovary can mm -hmm. penetrate in the dorsal cortex. Okay. So, so this is unusual for... In all uh, individuals you found this feature yes. or some no, no. of them? No, in all of them. That okay. I have uh, done cross-sections, mm -hmm. it uh, launched uh, transversal, transversal cross-section, it's all like that. Okay, okay. I thought it, in some individuals you saw that it was close and in others, okay. No. Thanks. Welcome. Uh, ask you if you did your this drawing by your hand, or uh, did another uh, Frisella, for example. I was... I did the drawing by pencil, but in Geneva that I work also in uh, collaboration with Alain de Chambrier in the Natural History Museum in Geneva, and they have a painter that make by ink. So it was him that finished the drawing. I did just a pencil, and he finished. Quality of free salt was very nice. Yeah. I like it. So, another question. I have a question. It's not much, much scientific, but I'm really curious. Uh, I was going through the list of species of fish uh, in the in the checklist. paper. Yeah, checklist. Mm -hmm. Where did you get a specimen of uh, ocean sunfish? Mm, Where no. did you get the specimen of ocean sunfish? No, no, no. This is I got from the literature. It's not uh, my, no, this is, was, a, I couldn't do any of this work in my PhD. This was just a compilation of reports <coughs> to have an uh, idea how diverse or what kind of holes they have and so on. But I got from the literature, it's, it was not uh, my sampling. Thanks for an interesting question. Uh, on the previous slide where you showed the, the phylogeny of uh, your new genus, so in, in one parasite genus, Ophiotenia, so it, it's a monophyletic clade, uh, including macrobotrid and another one. Yeah. Genus. So, so these are parasites of, of uh, snakes, but uh, in Australia, Madagascar, yes. Vietnam, yes. Uh, unrelated uh, so, uh, zoogeographical regions. So, so it means that the, the genus of parasites is older than separation of continents, or how do you explain this biogeographic pattern? <laughs> <laughs> Good question, for me. Uh, I don't know. Ophiotenia, Galagi, Australia. It, it seems. That was what you said, but I'm not sure. But the Ophiotenia is actually, it's not, yeah, as you can see, it's not monophyletic. And other species of uh, Ophiotenia cluster in different parts of the tree. This is just uh, one part that uh, Fresella cluster, but Ophiotenia is a uh, polyphyletic uh, genus. But still, eh, this genus, so it, it means that the, the worms are really so old and, and morphologically very stable, or...? I, I think that was the, the, the question of uh, colonization, <coughs> this, this whole switching that was more important. You, you know, the f fish, like the group, are very old. Ichthyologists, the origin of fish is more than 300 million years old. Mm -hmm. So they are much older than the continental drift. Mm -hmm. So... It's easy, yes. because I, I'm not sure about the steps of continental drift, but 300 years old group was Pangea, it was not Pangea. Yes, before Pangea. Before Pangea, yeah. Mm -hmm. Much older, yeah, and it was, the, the fish was living this time, as I was a bit old. Mm -hmm. <laughs> More questions? <laughs> I'm still wondering uh, how much the traditional morphological based approach matches the molecular molecular based approach in, in a species level taxonomy. Almost uh, nothing. Nothing. But, 
Uh, it, it, you mean uh, that uh, I mean, the molecular species, species level, species level. So species identified based on morphology. Some Is species, there any cryptic species or some 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 uh, genera? They they shows uh, that they form monophyletic clades, but in, like the big uh, genus like Protocephalus, Ophiotenia, Nomibis collex, that are uh, genera with more than ten species. They cluster in different parts of the tree. Just uh, this genera with uh, two or three species, some of them can cluster. But in general, there is no uh, uh, pattern. It seems are artificial. But we still, for example, this classification of subfamily that we uh, saw that is uh, artificial. We don't have any other classification to follow. So we still are using this traditional classification uh, of woodland. Some more question? I had a question, but it's not very scientific as well. But I wanted to ask uh, at the beginning, uh, was the percentage of results related to your first trip? I mean, as we saw the equipment uh, where you have had almost nothing. So was that percentage of results in your PhD thesis forming? This, oops. Uh, yeah. How many samples or was the percentage of results which, belong, <laughs> which is related to your it, first? It was, it was not, not good because I, I did a lot of mistakes when I was fixing. I didn't use the hot formalin and the warm zone coilet. And uh, we must have, for example, the parasite alive, of course, to fix. It doesn't matter if you have a, a dead parasite and you fix in a hot fixative, it it will not work because he is already contracted. Uh, so I didn't follow these basic steps and my results were really bad from this sample trip. And then Thomas taught me how to do properly and I, I could get the material from this uh, river, Shingo River. May I continue? How, how many fish uh, species altogether did you just get, and, and how usually you get the fish in a Yes, this is a, a good trip. question because I, in some sample trips, I was with some colleagues that they told me that they know the place, uh, I know how to get the fish, but finally we were there waiting and no fish appears. So I think that's really important to know the fishermen from the, the, the locality, because they know exactly where the fish, the fish is. This is a knowledge that we never uh, can get from our colleagues. They know exactly, you, you need which kind of host, Pirarara, that is this Fractocephalus. It's a common name, Pirarara. I know where I get this fish, and uh, it was mostly by fishermen. That, that samples that were good were when we hired some fishermen to go with us. And yeah, I was, it was really an adventure because I was alone in, where is, I, it is me. Uh, it was me, uh, a colleague of mine and the fisherman in this boat and the water was coming and I need to take the water uh, off of the boat. And we spent like four days in the field with not any basic stuff. The, uh, the mosquitoes biting a lot, they don't respect repellent, they don't care, they just bite. <laughs> and and uh, yeah, it was really an adventure. And the fisherman knew the, the local that he could take the fish that I wanted. Some more questions? Following this, this discussion, and how, how difficult it to find the parasites? So I mean, how many fish you, you, you need to dissect to find the prevalence and your parasites or the parasite you like? It it really de depends on the host. For example, uh, cicla, that is uh, uh, the, one of the biggest uh, species of uh, cichlid in the in the world. Every cicla that we open, there are uh, tapeworms. It's like a one hundred percent of prevalence. But uh, some species of uh, catfish we need to uh, dissect more than 10 to get like 7 or 
five, and even these parasites of snakes and amphibians, they are really low in about the prevalence, less than ten percent. So it's really hard to get uh, from it's from this. You have to kill a lot of hosts. a lot of yes. So I work on fish that is easier. Just a small question. Would you sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Would you need some permission for uh, catching the fish in Amazon? No, because the fisherman he he has the permission. So what I, what I will do? Uh, he uh, take the fish for for him, like uh, to sell, and we take the intestine. We have this photo that is our vulture of the fish with the coat, and then the fisherman can sell the the fish for the yeah. His work, his job. Yes. I have a very short question related to that. So, which, which species of fish is the most tasty? Most tasty. <laughs> okay, so this one is the most tasty. I have, yeah. Pseudoplatistoma. <clears throat> this is really tasty fish. That they have a lot of ways to prepare and to cook, and I was really. Uh, uh, and also, sea is really good, really tasty. Okay, thank you. Which species of tapeworm? <laughs> which species of? Tapeworm. In which one? Which species is the most tasty? Ah, most tasty? I didn't try. I'm eating whole types. I didn't try any. Just, uh, I want just to ask you, uh, for the selection of the fish, you have, before, when you started your... Uh, job and you have gone for this job, the selection for the fish, it was by other or it was selection by some goals, specific goals? Yes, uh, it, my, my thesis is about this diversity, so taxonomy, and I was willing to catch mostly ciliary forms that I, I knew from the literature that they were the, the most infected and uh, the data that I got, I... I could see this uh, this pattern, and I was looking mostly for those guys, but also Cicla, that is interesting. It's uh, endemic from the Amazon, but they are uh, introduced in the south, in the Paraná river basin, and also even in North America they are introduced. And I wanted to see if there is some uh, pattern of population from the Paraná river basin and the uh, Amazon river basin. So yeah. But mostly is I I open and I dissect every fish that I, I could and focus focus on the catch fish. Okay. Thank you. I have another question. You said that in the case of cichlids there is a high prevalence of, of cestodes, and in the case of solar forms it's lower prevalence. Do you have some explanation for that? Mm. It's it's lower but it's not yeah, it depends of the, the whole for example this big um, Pseudoplatysma, you can, out of the pseudoplatysma that you open, also you can find uh, parasites. It's really varies. It, uh, yeah. Another question. Uh, in the case, for instance, in, in cichlids, you said there is a high prevalence in one species or specimen of fish. There is only one species of cestodes, or there are some combinations? Two, two species. Uh, and uh, it's interesting because these two species are the smallest uh, one of Proto. They measure like uh, 5 millimeters, and uh, for comparison, you can see this Fresella is 11 centimeters. And last question. Uh, last question. <coughs> in the case, we you invested in intestine just for protocephalus. Yes. In, during these dissections, are you able to find also some other groups of cestodes? Yes, we, we found. Uh, nematodes, uh, cantocephalans, I mean, we could I'm find, and also we fixed uh, the uh, gills for monogenians. But uh, I, when I opened the fish, I was directly going to the intestine because I know that it, I can be fast. I need to be fast. Thank you. It was a long discussion, <laughs> and if uh, thanks, th actually thanks for it. And if somebody would like to meet Philippe, maybe we will uh, go for a coffee to Cafe Lavka, and you can.
find him there and ask him more and more questions if you want. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.